It is sometimes an appropriate response to reality to go insane. Philip K. Dick Welcome back to Axel Beats and our villain series. Last time we covered sympathetic villains, so today we're going to be talking about insane ones. These come in a ton of different styles and categories, and they're often used to make the audience feel uncomfortable, concerned, or even to make us question or doubt the society within the story. This category might not always be the most popular, and it is definitely one of the most controversial, but I think that when these characters are done right, they can be some of the most memorable and impactful that a series has to offer. As always, we're going to have timestamps for anyone who wants to avoid spoilers, but with all that being said, let's take a look at who we're talking about. Roll the intro. I'm changing who I am. I'm making a new plan. Rearranging my life and I won't look back ever again. Yeah. You ain't see me activated. You better hope that you never see me agitated. I think about my actions, plan them out, evaluated. That's how I end up on the top, man. I'm calculated. I'm changing who I am. I'm making a new plan. Rearranging my life, and I won't look back ever again. So, a few things before we get into the actual video. Firstly, the next video I'm going to be doing in this series will be on villains with god complexes. So if you have suggestions for characters you would like me to take a look at, or you have ideas for this video that you would like to hear me discuss, let me know those in the comments down below. Second, as you guys know, we've been talking a lot about storytelling and character design lately, which is why I am so happy to announce that today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Welcome to the realm of Teleria, a land conquered by the Dark Lord Xeroth. Here you will encounter a seamless blend of PvE and PvP as you collect and level up powerful heroes and work together with some of the 80 million players worldwide to make your mark on history. Raid is completely free to play with console quality graphics available on your smartphone and over 650 completely unique champions. But if you're watching this video, I know that you love villains, so don't worry, Raid's got some great ones. Like my top three favorite bosses including Kuldoth the Magma Dragon, who will burn away your HP, Soroth the Frost Spider, who lowers your accuracy and freezes you, and Borgoth the Scarab King, who takes advantage of your team's buffs. Or you can always challenge other players to assert your dominance over them. And don't worry about running out of content because Raid is updated every single month. They're even releasing a legendary champion based on MMA and pro wrestling legend Ronda Rousey, who you can get for free right now, and all you gotta do is log in and play Raid for 7 days between now and February 20th. Not to mention you can use code RAIDRONDA for a 3-day 100 XP boost, 500,000 silver, and 5 energy refills. And even more rewards if you're an Amazon Prime member. I've actually been playing this game for a few months now alongside my brother, and it's been a blast. So don't put it off any longer. You can use the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to get started today in Raid Shadow Legends for free on iOS, Android, and PC. And if you do so, you'll get $30 worth of bonuses, that is one free epic champion, the powerful Tyrell, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, XP boost, and ancient shard, so you can summon some awesome champions as soon as you get into the game. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends, now let's get back into the video. Now I feel like I'm gonna need to clarify what I mean when I say we're talking about an insane or crazy villain, because I'm sure that some people will have a problem with that generalization or that term, especially since we're focusing on examples that are particularly violent, they are villains. And I'm just gonna start by saying I'm gonna try to be as respectful of the topic as possible while still discussing these characters. Will I say everything perfectly? Probably not. It can be a pretty tricky thing to talk about at the best of times, and that's even when you're not discussing villains. But I'm going to try, and nothing I say here is representative of real people who are dealing with mental illness in any way. We are just going to be talking about how it's demonstrated and used in storytelling for better or for worse. Now, as you may have noticed, mental illness is often tied to villainous characters, especially when we're looking at Western series, as it can be a very simple way to make them either more sympathetic or more frightening, depending on the context and manner in which they are used. And certainly, we're going to talk about villains who are psychotic or dealing with more severe mental health issues. However, also included in this will be characters who become deranged or psychopathic because of events in their life, as well as characters who are presented as insane because they don't inherently fit into the mold of the society that they find themselves in, 
Characters who are presented to be delusionally insane, who often act in calculated and well-thought-out ways, and characters who are agents of chaos, and as a result are seen to be crazy. And off the bat, I think we need to talk about shortcomings of this character archetype, or the things that should in general be avoided for the most part. And first and foremost, I think that the idea of irrationality can be a very big issue. While there are cases of mental illness which could lead people to acting irrationally, by and large, most real examples are people who act in a way which is rational to them. This might not fit the social paradigm, and that could make their actions seem strange or off-putting as a result to others, but characters depicted as acting completely randomly because of mental illness, to me at least, kinda feels like a cheap and hollow cop-out. The characters' actions, motivations, and goals need to make sense still, and the idea of, meh, they're crazy and they just feel like doing it, usually isn't enough. Even in a more severe case, let's say someone who is experiencing hallucinations, they're still going to act rationally to that hallucination. You'll never have someone seeing images of a monster and then deciding to go pick flowers because those two things aren't connected and this random action wouldn't make sense. If someone's imagining that they see a monster, they're going to be acting with fear, they're going to scream, they're going to run away. Whether or not their experiences are based within reality, they should still typically act as though they are. Second, I think both glorification and demonizing of mental illness is also a big issue. A character shouldn't be cool or badass because they have a mental health problem, nor should they be depicted as evil, creepy, or bad only because they have a mental health problem. With rare exceptions, which we can talk about later, they need to have a character beyond just being mentally ill. And lastly, writers using the dynamic of a mentally ill character should do some research. Presenting a character that is a flat crazy is kinda lazy, and it rhymes so you know it's true. Sure, if it's done right, it can be fine. But if you have an idea of what kind of mental illness a character is exhibiting, don't just mishmash a bunch of random symptoms together with stereotypes and assumptions. That's how we end up with movies like Split, which while admittedly is a pretty entertaining movie, is also probably one of the worst representations possible of the mental health issues that they are presenting. And worse yet, it is a depiction that is specifically meant to play up these disorders as something violent, scary, and dangerous. And for sure, people who are experiencing mental illness can be dangerous to those around them, but you don't want to paint them in a way that all people who have mental illness or, or all people who have X disorder are dangerous and scary. You don't want to undersell it, but you can't be irresponsibly overselling it either. You need to understand the psychology and present it respectfully. That said, you also obviously need to give leeway and credence to the idea that this is a character who is a hero or a villain in a fictional world. And to that effect, some embellishment is going to play a role, and that's okay. It just has to be done with some level of consideration and respect. Lastly, I'm not a psychologist. Obviously, I'm a guy who sits at home talking about anime for a living but I am going to try and talk about similar or related conditions if I can find them. I did a decent amount of research for this video, I'll post sources on screen when relevant, but even so, like I said, I probably won't be perfect. So if you have corrections or supplemental information that you can leave in the comments down below, that would be fantastic and very much appreciated. We're all doing our best out here. Obviously, not all of the authors do this kind of research on the topics, but if I'm going to be talking about how well these characters who have mental health disorders are being used in storytelling, I feel like I should also be talking about how well they're being used as representatives of these conditions. So we can skip the X author didn't think that deep into it, because regardless of if these things were thought out, and I hope they were, how the audience actually perceives what is being presented is just as important as what the author wanted to present. On that note though, I want to start with talking about a character that for the most part I think is a pretty solid example of addressing mental health disorders in My Hero Academia's Endeavor. It's okay if you don't forgive me, because I don't want forgiveness. I want to atone. Okay, okay, okay. Before we get into the comments, yes, I know in the show currently, Endeavor is shown to be a hero, and that My Hero Academia literally has a class of characters called villains, and he is not part of that. But I'm going to be taking a look at the Endeavor that we are first introduced to. Sure, he is one of the top heroes, 
but he's also by no means a good person, and the dude is clearly not well mentally. We are looking at pre-redemption arc Endeavor, and while he is a hero within society itself, he is painted as more of an antagonist or object of fear for the main cast and for the audience, especially early on. Now, later in the video we're going to be talking about how obsession is used, which is definitely something that applies to Endeavor, but with him specifically, I want to discuss the trope of characters who in some way become their own greatest enemies, and in dealing with that, exhibit kind of crazy behavior. At a young age, Enji Todoroki watched his father trying to rescue a girl from a villain, only to die in the process. And here's where Enji began dedicating himself to this idea of becoming the greatest hero to honor his father's memory. So he enrolls in UA High and even chooses the name Endeavor, meaning to try hard to do or achieve something or to strive to reach a goal. Enji here being very clear that this dream of his was at the core of his identity, and by the time he was 20 he had already reached the position of the second best hero. However, Endeavor's progress would stop here. No matter how hard he tried, no matter what he did or how much effort he put in, no matter how strong he became, he would never surpass All Might. Now, All Might at this time is a pretty standard Superman archetype character. He's this big, imposing figure, stronger than anyone else, faster than everyone else, and able to save countless people with seemingly no effort. This man can do no wrong, and that earns him the title of Symbol of Peace. To the entire nation, All Might becomes this pillar of hope holding up society. He would create a chasm between the villains and the citizens, and no one would need to struggle or fear as long as he was there. But what does that mean for Endeavor? This pillar holding up society lifted Endeavor's goals beyond his reach. The chasm between All Might and everyone else that protected the citizens was an ever-widening gap between he and Endeavor. The greater the light that All Might became, the greater the shadow Endeavor found himself inside of. And there are two ways to look at this, and ideally you'd be saying, hey, this is great, as Endeavor I am super powerful on my own, but now we also have this other guy who's even stronger as well, and together we can save everyone. But that's not always how the brain works. Endeavor's goal was never really to save people. Like, yes, he wanted to do that, obviously, but his dream was to honor his father by becoming the greatest hero. It's more based on pride and personal performance rather than altruism. So in his mind, rather than the idea of having two great heroes to save everyone, he would only begin to resent All Might. But more importantly, he could only see himself as a failure and eventually gave up on the idea of surpassing All Might altogether. So instead, he would decide that if he couldn't achieve his goals, he would pass that dream down to his child. Specifically, he thought that what was holding him back was his ability to overheat. He couldn't use his quirk too much because it became a danger to himself, and on top of that, while fire is great, it isn't exactly suitable for every situation. So he decides that if he could have a child who could balance these powerful flame abilities with an ice quirk to help cool him down, he could create a perfect hero heir to pick up his mantle. Turns out though, genetics can be pretty difficult to predict. His first son, Toya, would get even stronger fire abilities than he had, but inherited his mother's resistance to the cold rather than his father's resistance to heat, meaning he would always be putting himself in danger when he used his quirk. His second child only received an ice quirk, as did his third, and it wasn't until Shoto was born that he had a child with that perfect mix he was looking for, but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows after this. Over time, Endeavor had become more obsessive with this idea of the perfect heir, putting more and more stress on himself and raising his feelings of becoming a failure, while also developing a resentment towards both his wife and their children. This was supplemented by the loss of his first son, and all of this ironically, would snowball into him becoming more abusive towards everyone around him and hating himself more and more. By the time Shoto was actually born and he had what he was looking for, he needed to ensure that this was something worth all that he had done and given up to attain it. Something which ended up manifesting as brutal perfectionism and abuse towards Shoto. As I mentioned, Endeavor would later get his redemption arc, which, depending on who you are, is kind of received in different ways, but Let's talk quickly about how this character is set up and why I think it's well done. As I said, I'm looking at the idea of someone becoming his own worst enemy, and that leading them to some kind of madness. And in Endeavor, we see someone who is genuinely talented, powerful, and dedicated, but who never sees himself as enough, spiraling down a path of self-destruction, self-doubt, and resentment towards the world around him. 
His inability to recognize the good that he had and the hyper fixation on his shortcomings are self-inflicted scars that led him to this entire period of his life being filled with abusive insanity. Importantly, this time of mental illness does not stop him from functioning publicly. It doesn't affect his role of being a hero, sure he becomes a bit jaded, but he still is the number two hero, and it instead manifests behind the scenes with his family. People who struggle with mental health issues, be they depression or anger management or whatever else, aren't always going to act in crazy or irrational ways. These issues might manifest in specific portions of their life and leave other elements completely untouched. And as we see in the real world, a lot of times these can just be invisible to everyone else. Something that I like that Horikoshi does with Endeavor's character though is that he adds consequences to this point in Endeavor's life. Insanity in media can often be depicted as this all or nothing thing, especially in fiction. But more often than not, it isn't like that in real life. And in some cases, it can arise in one period of high pressure within their life and can settle down once the rest of their life starts to settle as well. This doesn't mean that they're magically healed, it doesn't mean that their actions never happened, and it doesn't mean that if they did something terrible, it needs to be overlooked. Or even that it can be overlooked. His wife attacking Shoto and being hospitalized, his damaged relationship with all of his kids, each of which having a different perspective on him trying to fix things later, these are all very real things for people who struggle with mental health for periods of their life. It isn't that people just randomly snap, it's often a build-up or an event that leads them to struggling, and in the same way, they can't just snap for a day, or even for a few years, hurt people around them, and then just go back to normal like nothing changed. Some people will be open to forgiving them, some people will struggle with that idea, and some won't be able to forgive them at all, or will even hate them for it. And some of the things that they do just can't be undone. Regardless of how people react though, there will always be an element where that person needs to live with their actions themselves as well. But will they choose to write these actions off, or will they endeavor to do better and make things right? I'm not the biggest fan of My Hero as a whole. I think it has a lot of inherent issues. However, one thing that I think Horikoshi does much better than the vast majority of other mangaka, especially in Shonen, is the depiction of mental health in a very tangible and honest way. And that's even considering that there are supernatural elements like quirks being interlaced here. And that's why we're going to be talking about My Hero a bit more as the video continues. As far as Endeavor though, I think that his character represents a very honest depiction of someone struggling with themselves and how it affects those around them, as well as the consequences that come with those actions. There's not really many elements that are taken over the top, even considering we're in a setting where by design everything is larger than life, and it's instead a very down-to-earth telling of how self-hatred and resentment can manifest into abusive behavior. Now before we get into the other My Hero characters, I want to talk about one of the most iconic villains in all of anime and manga, with Monsters, Johan Liebert. How weak the mind when it wants to forget. Maybe you didn't forget. Maybe you're lying. Is it a lie you tell everyone around you? You're guilty of murder. Do you think your lies can free you? Well, Richard, how about a drink? So, Johan is a villain who came up in the comments section of previous videos, but unfortunately, I haven't seen Monster. But it can't be that long of a series. It's only... 74 episodes, huh? Alright. Well, I guess I'll be right back. Alright, nearly 30 straight hours later, but we're here. I am exhausted, but that show was pretty excellent. Some complaints, some parts a bit dry, a bit slow, but absolutely worth the watch if you haven't seen it. And I definitely understand why so many people suggested it. That said, there is a lot to say about Johan, and while I'm going to talk about a good portion of it here, Future villain videos will go more in-depth on him, for sure. Obviously, when it comes to mental illness, Johan just has a lot to unpack. He is a clear sociopath, that being someone who isn't concerned with right or wrong, and who completely disregards the needs and feelings of others. But on top of that, he seems to be a nearly emotionless void. Sure, we still see him have some kind of emotion here and there, but 99% of the time, it's just blank. I think sociopathy is a pretty easy go-to when it comes to villains, because it allows them to act in these cold and brutal ways without any sense of morality stopping them, and lacking morality is just a very easy way to get to the idea of evil. But to me, this is, like, the most boring idea for a villain on its own. 
As always, it can be done in a good way, but megalomaniac sociopath isn't really exciting or innovative. Luckily, this isn't all that Johan is. The addition of him being emotionless turns him into something of a force of nature. Much like you wouldn't say a tornado or an animal is murderous for killing someone, the same could be said for Johan. It isn't just that he doesn't care for the lives of others, but he barely notices them. I would say they're like insects to him, but it feels even more extreme than that. They're almost more like tools or game pieces, and just like you wouldn't really care when a chess piece is taken, Johan looks at the lives of others in a very similar way. Sociopathy, more accurately antisocial personality disorder, is often associated with things like disregarding right and wrong, exploiting or lying to others, being cynical or callous, manipulating others for personal gain, and lacking empathy. All of which Johan shows off through the entirety of the series. And each of these factors kind of aid in how we see him. As the name of the anime suggests, he is a monster, and the mental illnesses that he deals with are clearly the cause of the person he develops into. In general, this is all done to make Johan feel somehow not human. Not less than human by any means, often being seen more like a god in the show, but it's also done in a very unsettling way. That said, there is one other piece of the puzzle that I believe is the secret to Johan being as iconic and successful of a villain as he is. On the surface, I think many people believe that Johan has the ability to corrupt others, sort of spreading the evil that's within himself to them. And while that certainly does seem to be part of it, there is more. If Johan does have some kind of special ability, I wouldn't say that it's corrupting other people's, I would say it's that he can immediately completely understand others and how they feel. And here is the disconnect that makes him feel as uniquely terrifying as he does. Johan himself is unable to exhibit emotions, but at the same time, he is seemingly able to walk up to just about anyone and instantly understand everything about them. Who they are, how they hide parts of themselves, what makes them angry or scared, and how to get them to act on those feelings in a way he would want them to do so. This might not be the best example, but to me it's kind of similar to when you learn that Beethoven was deaf and could still create these gorgeous compositions. And in much the same way that Beethoven understood the math and science and theory of what made music, Johann seems to understand the math, science, and theory behind what makes people tick. And as an outsider, there's some kind of disconnect towards people who are an expert in a field, but who are unable to experience that field themselves. The moment that really stood out to me when it comes to Johann is with Detective Braun. Braun had gotten into some trouble for drunkenly shooting someone in the past, but Johan sees through this, and is able to establish that Braun was sober when this happened almost immediately. And this ability to read others so perfectly can almost make it feel like he is omniscient. Add in that he's able to enact his will onto others through this process, and suddenly he feels omnipotent as well. Meaning we have this all-knowing, all-powerful character who can't feel emotion, and sees others as less than nothing. All bundled together to have a dominating presence, that makes the audience see him as a monster. But let's talk about the mental health portion of his character. At the core of Johan is the trauma he endured as a child, as well as the developmental blocks that it produced in him. And as this is an anime, we also couple this with the idea that he is innately, supposedly, the embodiment of evil, and that's kind of it. Johan's mental illness is ever-present, and it's never shied away from, but the elements are all exaggerated and then paired with concepts which amplify those traits. It's taking a lot of what we're obviously leaning very heavily into a portrayal of mental illness, but at the same time, Johan is never painted as the run-of-the-mill case. I don't look at Johan's character and think, yes, this is an example of what all sociopaths are like, but I can look at him and think, these are the traits of sociopathy that he is showing, and this is how the author amplified those traits through Johan's actions and abilities. We aren't supposed to see him as a normal sociopath, we're supposed to see sociopathy as a whole as a jumping off point for his character. And the reason I wanted to talk about Johan following Endeavor is how they're presented. Endeavor is seen as someone struggling with themselves, and we see that being lashed out on the world around him. Not because he hates others, but because he is angry with himself. But Johan's trauma comes from the world around him, and he learns to see life as something without value, and then treating all other lives as playthings as a result. The difference between these two is that Endeavor is an inward force being pushed outward, while Johan is an outward force being reflected on itself. 
And I think that this is a very subtle but interesting dichotomy to talk about. Beyond just the basis of how these characters are used, though, Endeavor is also seen as a character who is able to work towards redemption in the audience's eyes. But Johan isn't. And that's because it's impossible to empathize with Johan. There's nothing for us to latch on to there. And this is a function of both of these authors knowing how to present these characters in a way that allows them to control how much the audience can connect with them. And this is also something we see in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood with Father. I know I just talked about him last time, but I think he's an even better example of this than Johan because it's so on the nose, so let's talk about him very briefly as well. The life of an insect is so beneath you that it would be a waste of your time to even consider judging it. That would be an accurate summation on my feelings towards you humans. So as we talked about in our Sympathetic Villains video, card in the corner if you haven't seen it, there is a difference between Father and the Dwarf in the Flask, despite them being the same character. The Dwarf, while not looking human, is easier to empathize with. He's someone who is trapped, he has aspirations, he has emotions, and in the end we even feel pity for him. But as Father, he has none of these things. Father removes his seven desires from himself and creates the homunculi. And this is where the difference is made. Humanity is not just flesh, bone, and positive emotions. We have things like greed and lust, and without them, without the core parts of what make humans feel like people, we end up as these figures that look human but feel alien. Humans are made of wants, desires, hopes, and dreams, but we also have flaws. We can get depressed, angry, and jealous. Without these bits and pieces that form a complete person, you end up with these hollow figures that give off this heavy, dull, and disturbing vibe that's kind of like an emotional uncanny valley. And this is the case with both Father and Johan. When we look at Father, he becomes this almost god amongst men, while Johan is more like a monster within a crowd you instantly recognize that there's something definitely off just by looking at them or by listening to their voice, or how they talk to people, or even in the way that they move. They appear human, but we can't empathize for them at all. This is probably one of the most effective methods of using or creating neurodivergence in villains. By picking apart, isolating, or removing emotions, you can make characters feel completely alien to the world around them, and you can do so without aligning them to any specific mental health condition. I think the first example you might come up with for this kind of character would be sociopaths, but it can be broken down so much further than this, and you can go even beyond only villains. Sheena in Pet Girl of Sakurazo, for the most part, is unable to show emotions. Makima in Chainsaw Man never changes the intonation in her voice and is detached from and looks down on everyone she talks to. Or looking at protagonists like in One Punch Man or Mob Psycho, where the entire gag of their characters is that they are missing or rejecting emotional or social skills. As a result, they feel flat and can feel like they don't belong in the world that they're in, which makes them stand out despite how dry they are in comparison to that world. In all of these characters, there's this idea of flatlining one or more core part of the human experience. And in some cases, these characters do deal with some level of neurodivergence. Could be depression, sociopathy, BPD, or whatever else. And in other cases, it is simulated neurodivergence by picking off elements of their mental or emotional faculties. These characters are aiming to take advantage of or simulate interacting with neurodivergent people and bending that to supplement the story being told. Is it always done tastefully or effectively? Definitely not. But in the best cases, it can be a very interesting tool to play with that can give off the extra something special needed to produce a character like Johan or Father. In complete contrast to diminishing elements though, another thing that you can do is to crank those emotions up. For example, rather than disinterest, you could have obsession. In the same way a disconnect is produced when a character lacks something, having too much can also be unsettling. Although the feeling that we get is often a bit different and I kind of like to imagine it like a thermometer. When removing emotional or social skills, you're going to end up with characters who can feel cold, dry, or dull, and uncaring. It leans into characters who are boring on the surface, but can really excel into characters who are meant to be calculated or eerie. And if you heat things up, you add too much of something, you get obsession, enthusiasm, energy, 
and sometimes elements of unpredictability. This type of character can be played very differently with positive effects as well. You can make them a bit comedic, or cute, or fun, and it often fits in there pretty well, whereas Johan being used for comedy probably would never work. Some examples off the top of my head for this are Gluttony in Fullmetal Alchemist, who is a really effective example, typically appearing like this goofy and childlike man, which is very, very fun, but having these moments of frenzy-like hunger where he devours people. And that contrast makes it hugely impactful. Toguro in Yu Yu Hakusho is obsessed with battle because he's looking for someone to defeat and kill him. He's made out to be this brutal but engaging and fun rival for Yusuke. Shu in Tokyo Ghoul is all about cannibalism, but in a classy, gourmet way, which is something. And of course, Hisoka is obsessed with the idea of f***ing Gon. Ahem. <clears throat> well, you get it. These are often characters that have more warm personalities and who are slanted towards actions. But that's just kinda it. These characters are often obsessed with things like actions and concepts and things. And while this can be very off-putting, the crazy vibes are nowhere near as strong as when we talk about characters who are obsessed with people. And that's where you know Gasai comes in. No, I'm not an imposter! I swear it, Yuki! I can... I can explain! You believe me, don't you? Don't you, Yuki? We can get through this! Okay, so, like, off the bat, you know, is insane. And, like, insane insane, you know? But on top of that, there's also three different versions of her over different timelines, but one of them becomes another, and then in the epilogue she lives another four more timelines. The short version is, there's a lot to her, and she's a bit of a convoluted character to talk about. Also, is she a villain? Sort of? We're not really painted as anyone being in the right in this series, so I'm gonna stretch the rules a bit here and include her. Plus, my video, my rules. The original Yuno, though, was raised in pretty horrific circumstances. She was an abandoned orphan who would be adopted by a fairly happy family. However, as money problems began to arise, her parents would start to become more and more emotionally and psychologically abusive. Her father would stay at work late trying to make some extra money, and while he was away, her mother would try to train her to become the perfect citizen. Meaning something along the lines of someone who always stuck to a very strict schedule, a strict diet, and followed every rule. To achieve this, her mother would lock Yuno in a cage and completely control and time when she was allowed to do anything, including sleeping and eating. However, she fed Yuno so little that she would be forced to eat inedible materials just to survive. While her father objected to this, he also did nothing to really stop it, meaning the only person who could have helped her just didn't care enough to do so. So let's pause the story here because that's a fucking yikes from me. This is just about as traumatic and abusive an experience that I could imagine possible for a young child to go through. And this kind of thing would undoubtedly lead to psychological damage. This is also about as akin to parental abduction as you can get, except that the other parent is still in the picture and just unwilling to help you. Arguably making it worse. In terms of real-world incidents similar to this, there are a plethora of symptoms or conditions that children might develop. Deirdre Rand in the Spectrum of Parental Alienation Syndrome described how a troubled parent can override the developmental needs of a child, with the result that the child becomes psychologically depleted and that their own emotions and social progress becomes crippled. In these cases, things like depression, loss of community, stability, security, and trust, excessive fearfulness in ordinary occurrences, a general sense of loneliness, anger, helplessness, a disruption in identity formation, and a fear of abandonment all can develop, which, I mean, almost entirely is reflected within Yuno's character through the story. And yes, it is exaggerated for entertainment and storytelling purposes, but these are all sort of at the core of Yuno's experience. On top of this, disorders like reactive attachment disorder are more likely to develop in children who go through this sort of thing. A few of the relevant symptoms to Yuno could include things like being unable to engage in satisfying reciprocal relationships, general superficial engaging, indiscriminate affection towards a stranger or strangers, underdeveloped conscience, compulsive lying, fascination with weapons, blood, and gore, functioning on a one-day-at-a-time perspective, and showing cruelty towards animals or other people. 
Of course, this is just one possibility, and we don't have a solid answer as to the disorders or conditions that she's developed here, but I think this all generally helps us to understand a lot of Yuno's actions going forward, because at this point, she is pretty severely mentally scarred. Eventually, Yuno would manage to escape, and instead trapped her parents in the cage, where they would both starve to death. You know, kind of beyond dealing with the real world at this point, leaves the corpses in the cage and continues to talk to them as though they were alive. And here's a pro tip for authors out there, if you want to make a character feel crazy in a very terrifying and delusional way, have them kill and then continue to talk to their parents. It is pretty consistently scary as fuck. Soon after, she would cross paths with Yuki in detention, and he makes a joke about marrying her in the future that she completely latches onto, and believing him to be genuine, she becomes obsessed with him. Which brings us back to the whole lack of reciprocal relationships, superficial engaging, and indiscriminate affection. As the story progresses, Yuno would become more and more protective over Yuki, and jealous when he talked to anyone else. You know, other people in Yuki's life become a symbol of an enemy trying to steal away the boy that she loves, and it doesn't matter if they are a friend, a rival, or even his mother. Unless they blankly support Yuki being with her, they are a threat to her, as well as the secure future that she is trying to build. Yuki had, in her head, made a promise for a shared future. And to Yuno, who lacks a sense of stability, and who is looking at the world in a one-day-at-a-time kind of way, this is a steady path forward. And because of this, she becomes obsessed with him. She is willing to kill to keep him safe, as well as to take out anything that might ruin this future that she sees with him. Now, I think psychologically, Yuno is a bit extreme, to say the least. But I also think that she's still a fair representation in terms of a character experiencing this kind of trauma in a series meant for entertainment. For the most part, anyways. However, let's take a look at the actual obsession part of her character. Firstly, we're given a reason for her to be over-reliant and dependent on Yuki, as well as her extreme jealousy and fear of losing him. This is, of course, supplemented by her delusional view of the world and the trauma that led to it. As I mentioned early in this video, it's a rational perspective on mental health disorders. You know, isn't acting randomly, none of her thoughts or feelings are coming from nowhere, and the audience is able to connect the dots to form an idea of what she's thinking and feeling at any point in time. Obviously, some things are brought to an extreme and pushed too far, but that's what makes it so effective. We can see all of the through lines that she is following, but she takes everything one step beyond where the audience is comfortable with, and that's where the writer is able to take the reins and control how you feel while you're watching the series. So, you know, is a great example of how interpersonal relationships and abuse can be used to produce insanity in storytelling. But let's take a look back at My Hero Academia, where society, or the individual themselves, present similar effects. The middle schooler who mauled her classmate, injuring him badly, is still alive. We did our best, but we Tell obviously was always failed. Smiling and friendly. That child is a demon. So for this next section, I'm going to be trying something a little bit different and having my friend OG cover this next character, because I think this is a really fun series in general, but it could be a kind of neat way for me to work with some of my friends and get them involved in my channel, which I've always wanted to do, but it's kind of difficult with the topics I choose. Plus, he's like the only one I know who loves Toga as much as I do, so I figured it's pretty fitting. If you guys are looking for another chill content creator who makes videos similar to the ones I make, but with a much more digestible and reasonable length to his videos, be sure to check him out after this one. He just hit 5k, he's working towards 10, so please consider helping him reach that goal. Anyways, let's get into Toga. In her fight against Curious, Himiko Toga asks one simple question. What is a normal life? This is an important question when discussing any mental health related issues, and it's one that helps understand why Toga interacts and connects with people the way she does. In the world of MHA, even those with seemingly great quirks can be pushed towards the margins of society. Spinner and the other heteromorphs are widely discriminated against for how they look, and anyone with a quirk like Toga's that's strange or unusual is forced to hide what makes them unique. Now, let's be clear, it's not like what Toga was doing as a kid was healthy. She was going around and picking up dead birds. But you have to look beyond what she was actually doing. Toga develops very strong emotional attachments to people, and because her quirk involves copying others by ingesting their blood, she also connects with people through blood. The combination of those two, in theory, isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, just look at Vlad King. He uses a blood quirk and nobody has a problem with it. 
but because the particular way Toga was expressing her emotions as a child wasn't normal, she was forced to bury that way of expressing herself, effectively forcing her to bury her very real emotions towards others. And although they don't have Toga's interests at heart, the Liberation Army is spot on when they explain how society failed her. The only reason Toga connects with people in unhealthy ways now is because the way she tried to as a kid wasn't normal. It didn't fall under the normal way to use a quirk. So the institutions that prepared the normal people for success and healthy relationships effectively doomed Toga and pushed her towards becoming an outcast, and eventually a villain. Instead of just telling her to bury them, she could have been taught how to express her strong emotions in more constructive ways that didn't involve hurting others. But because those institutions are so rigid, they labeled Toga as unusual. Since she couldn't express herself around the normal people, she decided to join the world of villains where she was free to express her emotions the only way she knew how to. Which is what she communicates to the audience when she tells Curious that she wants to live a normal life. Toga probably wouldn't have turned out as a villain if Hero Society had adapted to her situation. But that's the weakness of this kind of society. It restricts individuals to the conventions of everyone else. And that's why Toga is such an important character in MHA. Her unhinged personality reflects the major weakness in hero society, and she fights for her own normal in a world that labels her a deviant. In general, Toga belongs to a category of characters who just does not belong within the societal system that's in place, and who becomes repressed until she explodes and seeks out a place that she can feel like she belongs and truly embrace who she is. After all, within My Hero Academia, quirks aren't just an extension of who you are, they are a part of who you are, often with part of your identity and personality stemming from these abilities. So being told your quirk is scary, unnatural, or disgusting is essentially like being told that you are scary, unnatural, and disgusting. In fact, Horikoshi heavily pushes this within the characterization within the series. For example, Bakugo's quirk allows him to make explosions, so his personality surrounds this idea of being easy to set off. Kirishima is someone who can harden their body, so he is someone dependable that doesn't break under pressure. Ochako can make things float and constantly tries to emotionally lift up those around her. But what does that mean on the villain side of the character list? Dobby has flames that are incredibly powerful but burn away his body as they're being used. He's someone with all the potential in the world, but who will burn himself out. And Toga can drink people's blood to change into them. In other words, Toga's power is to become someone else. To choose to not be herself. And when your parents hate you because your quirk scares them, when you need to hide who you are, and when society tells you that you don't belong, that's going to feel pretty natural because you're probably going to want to be someone else. But what if society wasn't the issue here, and what if it was your quirk that was the reason you went mad? Well, that's where Jean, or Twice, comes in. There's no place in the world where crazy people can belong. Heroes only care about saving good citizens. But the League accepted me as I am, problems and all. And I'd like to think I'm okay with who I am too. We're all wackos looking for a place we belong. Twice doesn't really have a quirk that society would look down on, but it is one that he struggles with. Quite simply, he can make copies, and this in itself is fine, but Gene is a lonely dude. He had no friends and no family that he could be with, so he decides to make copies of himself, and then had those copies make copies, and then those copies made copies, and so on and so on. For a while, he was almost like a king of this group, always giving them orders and having them do the things that he didn't want to, but all of these copies also shared his personality and memories, and eventually they would rise up against him. Each copy believed that they were the original, and a massive brawl broke out where basically they fought until they killed each other and only one was left. But that leaves a few questions. If there are dozens of you, and all of them genuinely believe that they are the original, and all of them have the same ability to copy things, how do you know which one is the actual original? How do you know if you didn't kill the original? How many versions of himself did he have to kill in order to survive? This all flooded into him and became a source for existential dread, driving him completely insane. Unsure of his own existence and thinking that at best he was the original, but more likely he was probably some fabrication or monster who had killed the original. Twice is a character that I have a lot of sympathy for. 
But the saddest part though is that even before this happened, he felt he was too broken to fit into society, and now things were even worse. From here, he felt himself a nuisance that the heroes wouldn't save. He removed himself from public and chose to join the League of Villains, because while the heroes would shun him, the villains would embrace him. When confronted by Hawks, he says, You people ain't heroes. Never are, never were, none of ya. You throw us to the wolves, all of us downtrodden folks. And it's not just him. After his death, Toga in Chapter 287 asks, Where do they draw the line? If heroes are supposed to save people, then was Jean not considered a person? Will they kill me too? These heroes who are supposed to be beacons of hope for everyone had become emblems of the neglect and disdain that society held towards them. They weren't worth saving. They weren't even people, they were nothing. And because of that, I think that Twice and Toga paint a very interesting picture of how individuals with mental health disorders can be treated by society. While ideally they would be looked at the same as everyone else, that just isn't the case all the time. They're often looked down on, ostracized, rejected, and it can feel like the world around them doesn't accept them. I mean, even on the smallest level, there are parents who can't understand the challenges that some kids with depression face. And that's like one of the most common and understandable issues out there. So if a parent can struggle with one of the easier mental health issues to understand, then imagine how strangers or society as a whole would fail to grasp some of the more complex ones. There is nothing inherently wrong in the cases of either Twice or Toga, but the structure of society failed to allow them to healthily and safely express themselves and their abilities. They failed to offer them the opportunities that they needed and rejected who they were. Imagine a world where Twice hadn't felt isolated and like he needed to become a criminal to survive, or where Toga could become a copy of another hero to help fend off threats celebrating these abilities that could have changed the world rather than shutting them down. They had the potential to be great heroes, but they felt like they couldn't be accepted by that world, so instead they turned to the people who would accept them. Now that said, there should be cultural norms to some extent. I'm not saying it should be okay for Toga to go suck the blood from random people, and that line needs to be okay. Feel free to draw those parallels with the real world however you see fit. There are some lines that just shouldn't be crossed. Can't go around assaulting people, killing people, stealing whatever we please, yada yada. But in a world like My Hero Academia offers, I doubt the idea of blood being related to a quirk is completely unheard of. I mean, just in the story that we had so far, we have both Toga and Stain being examples of people who have these abilities. So set up a donor system or something in the same way that they can produce these insane and intricate things for the students at UA to train their abilities. This is a society with everything going their way. They have medical quirks to heal people, abilities that can help them build or construct things, super geniuses, people who are super strong, super fast, and the other millions of benefits that quirks can give. This could and should be a utopia, but instead it is still divided between the people who have and have not. There are heroes, there are politicians, there are citizens, and there are villains. And within that system, those with undesirable or strange quirks are constantly pushed down until they're forced into the lower rungs. Neither Toga nor Twice were naturally insane. Rather, they lacked a place in society, they lacked opportunity, and they lacked acceptance, and these feelings would build up, leading them to descend into insanity. It was then that I found there was no escaping this hell. The lives you've led cannot possibly be compared to what I've been through. From that moment forward, I swore that I would destroy everything they held dear. A lot of the characters we've talked about so far have been ones who have kind of slowly descended into madness or into having mental health disorders. However, this isn't always the case. While the slow transition can be filled with nuance and commentary on social climate that allows for some pretty in-depth discussion, on the other side we have singular acts which are so impactful and traumatic that they can completely warp a character on the spot. In storytelling, these tend to be scarier or better shock value elements that can be used in a couple different ways. A pretty great example of this though can be seen in Doflamingo from One Piece. Dofi's family were celestial dragons, essentially the god kings of the One Piece world, 
who would kill anyone who questioned them or acted against their rule. His father, Homing, felt like they were no better than average people, though, and wanted to step away from this more lofty lifestyle, something which Dofi detested. As someone who had been raised with ungodly power, Dofi expected the commoners in his new home to follow his every order. However, they refused. Not only this, but angered by the wrongs of the world nobles as a whole, and unmoved by Homing's act of humility, they would gather together and burn down the Don Quixote mansion, forcing Doflamingo's family to relocate to a small shack and scrounge for food out of garbage cans. Conditions which would eventually lead to the death of his mother. Even through this, though, Dofi was angry, but still pretty well put together. He resented his father for giving up the life of luxury that they had been leading and bringing them into poverty, and of course he hated the people who were attacking his family, but this is all pretty reasonable and understandable feelings at this point. Later, though, the others in the town felt that this life of poverty was still too good for former Celestial Dragons, deciding that only through torture and death would they begin to atone for the evils of the world nobles. So they attacked the Don Quixote family again, tying them up and hanging them from a high wall over a pit of flames as the commoners began to curse at the former world nobles, and even started to shoot arrows at them as they were unable to get away. And this was Dofi's breaking point. Up until now, he had seen himself as above others and hated his father, but as he hung up on the wall, he would snap, vowing to hunt down and kill every person there, as well as burning the whole world to the ground. Dofi is never presented as a good person, more like a spoiled brat as a child who was a product of where he was raised. However, did he directly deserve what these people were doing to him? Absolutely not. They were attacking the only celestial dragons willing to actually build some kind of bridge with normal people, teaching Dofi that it isn't worth treating others with kindness and that if you have power, you will only be persecuted for giving that power up something which informs a lot of his character from this point on. Specifically though, Dofi would almost entirely lose his sense of empathy for anyone outside of his direct followers or family, going on to commit some of the worst atrocities in the series and forcing people to do terrible things as he laughed. But let's talk about the actual mental health bit behind this. Because as I said, Dofi was a spoiled brat growing up, but he was not the monster that he became. And this was the moment that flipped that switch, and you can couple that with Treble fostering his hatred and who would groom him into becoming someone who believed that he had the right to kill everyone, and this is kind of how you get Doflamingo. Even years after his family was strung up, he would still have nightmares about the event where he would wake up in a cold sweat, so clearly this traumatic event affected him deeply. But what are some of the effects that this kind of abusive trauma can have on a person? In Wyler B. Wydum's Psychopathy and Violent Behavior in Abused and Neglected Young Adults, it is suggested that a child might become desensitized to future painful or anxiety-provoking experiences, and that this desensitization might make them less emotionally and physiologically responsive to the needs of others. It might cause them to be callous and to lack empathy or remorse or guilt, adding in that it was like their capacity for empathetic response was completely turned off. And I would say that Dofi most certainly fits this description. And this can further be supported in Shimenti's Unveiling the Hidden Self, Developmental Trauma, and Pathological Shame, where it's concluded that traumatic memories built upon abuse, material neglect, and lack of emotional care could be responsible for a fragmented self which is dysregulated on a psychobiological level and that needs to have power and control over others through manipulation, deception, and violence which is basically everything that his devil fruit allows him to do when he becomes an adult. So again, Doflamingo is a fairly decent example of how this kind of traumatic abuse can affect a developing person and lead them to be more violent and less empathetic, as well as the need to control others to feel stability in their own life. As always, it is bumped up for entertainment purposes, but all the bits and pieces are there, just exaggerated to build a story. Now there's also offshoots of characters like Doflamingo though who just wish to see despair in others, but who don't seem to have the same level of trauma behind them. These characters are true sadists like Solf J. Kimbley in Full Metal Alchemist and Junko and Noshima in Danganronpa. The one thing worse than death is to avert your eyes from it. Look straight at the people you kill. Don't take your eyes off them for a second. And don't ever forget them. Because I promise that they won't forget you. 
Kimbley is a bit of an interesting case as we have two different representations of him between the 2003 anime and Brotherhood, and he's definitely one of the characters who changes the most between iterations. In the original series, he is just a sadistic psychopath. He gets enjoyment from destruction and murder, and there isn't all that much more to him, which is why I'm going to be looking at the 2009 version instead. In Brotherhood, Kimbley still has these sadistic tendencies, however his rhetoric, how he carries himself, and his method of describing the world around him are completely different. Kimbley, while certainly still a psychopath, is also an amoral, pragmatic realist. He can look at any situation clearly and from a neutral perspective, believing that morality is just something that gets in the way of progress, and that while the world presents a facade of peace, it is actually cold and brutal, so there is no point in fighting against that idea as a path forward. That said, he recognizes that his own views don't coincide with the general societal standards, and he can act in a more normal fashion when needed, or straight up get into a discussion about his philosophies that often leave people unable to really refute what he is saying. But in these discussions about different points of views, he is never malicious. He simply states his facts and works within those boundaries. Discussing things like the foolishness of Ed and Al trying to both get their bodies back and not harm others along the way, and how in this pursuit of both goals they would likely achieve neither. In the Ish Fallen War, when the other soldiers are having crisis of characters, he rationalizes the action of killing innocents by telling the other alchemists that they signed up to the military to follow orders and now they need to do so, asking them if they put on their uniforms expecting to never need to kill, especially in a war, then following up by saying that the only thing worse than death is to avert your eyes from it. While they were trying to look away from the people that they killed, he was looking right at them telling the other soldiers to never forget the victims' faces, because they will never forget theirs. Kimbley has this way of cold rationality that seems to bend you towards him. The way he talks, as well as the direct, factual, and realistic view that he has, make you almost need to listen to him. You probably won't always agree with most of what he's saying, but there's also never really a case where you can just say that he's flat out wrong, at least in a technical sense. Morally, you could write a book about how off the mark he can be, but pragmatically, Kimbley is a voice of reason who just happens to be shelled in an absolute psychopath. And this is an incredibly interesting method of using this archetype of character. 9 out of 10 times when someone is presented in a story to be psychopathic or to be bloodthirsty in the way that Kimbley is, they are just meant to be seen as insane. They're probably going to be villains, maybe they have a good speech here and there that gives you a glance at their perspective, and that's probably going to be their whole thing. But Kimbley is a mainstay throughout the series that consistently truly gives neutral and objective analysis of every situation. He is a voice of reason first, and a killing machine second. But most importantly, while he is an antagonist, he's not necessarily evil. He is amoral. He'll switch sides to whichever one benefits him the most at any given time. He doesn't inherently oppose the views of the protagonist or the villains, but he will absolutely call them on their shit when they are acting irrationally or with a lack of integrity. And that is such a unique perspective on how to use a psychopathic character in storytelling. In The Mask of Sanity, an attempt to reinterpret the so-called psychopathic personality, a psychopath is described as having an inability to experience empathy, guilt, or remorse, and as one who often fails to exercise sound judgment and lacks the basic foundation for socialized moral behavior. As such, psychopaths show a profound disregard for the rights and well-beings of others. At the same time, psychopaths are ordinarily not delusional or psychotic and they generally perform at normal to high levels of intelligence. So while definitely slanting towards more violent tendencies, which isn't exactly uncommon in psychopaths, but which is definitely adjusted for entertainment value here, Kimbley meets most of this checklist as a representative of mental health disorders. The only caveat in this is that those with psychopathic personalities tend to struggle with decision making, whereas making objective decisions is kind of the whole focus of Kimbley's character, and that seems to be what sets him apart from others in this archetype. And then there's me, Junko fucking Anishima. <laughs> Junko Anishima grew up as a homeless girl with outstanding analytical skills. 
so much so that she could completely predict the actions of those around her. This, however, took away from the excitement in life. Always knowing how things would happen left her bored and uninterested in everything. The only thing that truly brought her any joy was inflicting despair on others, because in moments of true despair, people had the opportunity to act irrationally and unpredictably. And so, Junko's plan is to throw the entire planet into despair through the tragedy, aka the biggest, most awful, most tragic event in human history, or the worst, most despair-inducing incident in the history of mankind. <sighs> Sometimes I feel like this series was made by an edgy 2016 kid, and it can be really painful to talk about because of that. But basically, Junko sets up a killing game where students will have to kill each other to survive, and then present a narrative to the world that causes complete social unrest, resentment, and ultimately riots which escalate into meaningless chaos, violence, and death. And Junko continues to pull strings to escalate things until there will only be despair. If you thought Future Diary was convoluted, this is about a million times worse. Junko, though, continues to put on killing games where she'd lock students within a school and promise to release whoever was the last person surviving, or whoever could manage to kill another student without being caught. After each murder, the remaining students would hold a trial and see if they could discover who the murderer was. If the murderer gets away with it, everyone else would be killed, but if they're found out, they would be executed. Oh, and Junko disguises herself as a white and black animatronic bear named Monokuma. Did I forget to mention that the whole series is just a lot to take in. There's plenty of students and plot points that I could go into, but even the simplest telling of its events are just all over the place at the best of times. So we're only going to focus on Junko here, and that is kind of where the issue is. Junko isn't so much a representation or representative of any individual mental health disorder, but is more so a depiction of, like, all of them, I guess. She shows signs of existential boredom, depression, psychological hedonism, she's a psychopath, a sociopath, and has constant shifting between her personality and mood. It is difficult to make a guess at just what the author was looking for here, but one of the common things people say is that she has dissociative identity disorder, what used to be called multiple personality disorder. However, as she swaps between these would-be identities, she keeps herself fairly consistent in her overall message. It isn't like she's swapping to a new identity, and it seems like it would just be too fluid for that to be the reason. More likely, if anything, we're dealing with borderline personality disorder. This affects how you feel about yourself and how you relate to others or behave. A few symptoms which would be relevant here are unstable relationships, such as idealizing someone one moment and then being cruel to them in the next, a rapid change in self-identity and self-image, stress-induced paranoia, impulsive and risky behavior, wild mood swings, and a feeling of emptiness and inappropriate, intense anger, being sarcastic, and being bitter. This disorder can be brought on by genetics, with abnormalities in someone's brain, or it can be caused by a particularly stressful childhood, possibly like in the case of Junko, who grew up homeless, depending on how traumatic that was for her. Now, this all seems like a possibility for Junko, but it doesn't really matter. The reason for this is that regardless of what disorder Junko has, this is kind of to the point where the representation is too over-the-top and cartoonish for it to really be relevant. The entire function of Junko's character is to say, hey, look a crazy person, and it makes it more of a spectacle than anything else. Don't get me wrong, Danganronpa is fun as hell, is an absolute guilty pleasure of mine, but you do lose that thread of value when it's presented like this. But that brings the question, do you need more value? Does it matter that the representation isn't great? That's kind of a personal question, especially when it comes to storytelling. On top of this, the series never says, hey, this is what people with X disorder is like and they straight up don't tell us what's wrong with Junko. Definitely a character that has a lot that could be said about her though, and I would love to hear what you all have to think in the comments down below. But as is the developing tradition in this series, I want to sprinkle in some Western entertainment as well. Specifically, we're going to look at a couple versions of the Joker. <laughs> all it takes is one bad day. That's how far the world is from where I am. Just one bad day. Sometimes I remember it one way, sometimes another. If I'm going to have a past, I prefer it to be multiple choice. You had a bad day once, am I right? Oh, I know I am. I can tell. 
The Joker has been portrayed in, well, who even knows how many ways by over 30 different actors over the years? From Cesar Romero to Jack Nicholson to Heath Ledger, John DiMaggio, and even the one that we don't talk about, each having their own twist on the character. Some are more goofy, some are more sadistic, and some are chaotic or tragic. He is a surprisingly nuanced character that can be shaped to fit whatever purpose a writer might need him to fit, and that's what makes this character so interesting to look at in the grand scheme of things. That said, there are core factors which follow through regardless of the story being told. First, he loves comedy, and will shape his plans around the idea of giving himself or others a good laugh. Second, he is some kind of mentally ill. This differs between versions, but there's always something that divides him from the usual societal views, and that results in him having a very twisted view of the world around him. Third, he may sprinkle in chaos and aim towards complete anarchy, but he is not random. There is always a method to his madness, and while things may seem random, his plans are usually incredibly well thought out. Again, take that with a grain of salt, but it is a general outline. Of all the actors who have played him though, it's only fitting to start my look at the Joker with my own personal favorite portrayal of his character, and no one does it quite like Mark Hamill. We've seen him cast as the Joker several times, but specifically I'm going to look at the portrayal in The Killing Joke. In this telling, the Joker was a fairly normal guy who quit working at a chemical plant to pursue his passions for performing comedy. However, he had a wife and a baby on the way, and he wasn't doing really well in this new field. They were backed up on their rent as it was, and the baby hadn't even been born yet. So, in an act of desperation, he turns to the Red Hood mob and agrees to help them rob his former workplace in exchange for one big payout that would help his new family land on their feet. But things didn't go exactly as planned. After agreeing to go on the heist, he would find that his wife had died in a tragic accident, removing his reason for even going on the heist. But the mob already told him too much, and forces him to go anyways, insisting that he wears the Red Hood outfit as well, as they were ultimately planning to use him as a fall man. Things get even worse when Batman arrives during the break-in and scared the Joker, causing him to fall into a vat of chemicals, which dyed his skin white and changed his hair to be green. All of this cumulatively adding into him going insane. This one singular day had broken him, and taken everything that he had. The premise to the killing joke follows the Joker as he tries to prove a point. He isn't denying his own insanity at all, but he is claiming that his insanity is sane. Or rather, that anyone experiencing a sufficiently bad day could be made insane themselves. Or as he puts it, all it takes is one bad day. That's how far the world is from where I am. Just one bad day. And this raises an interesting question to the audience. What would it take for you to break like he does? If you were already at rock bottom, but then you lose your loved one, a pregnant wife who was taken in an accident. If you became permanently disfigured or deformed. If you lost everything, would you still be able to keep it together? At this point, the Joker has no career, no money, no loved ones, and no reason to live. He had less than nothing, and yet the world still managed to take from him. And so he turns this question on others. His big scheme for the movie is to show Batman that others can be driven insane, using Commissioner Gordon as an example. He visits the Commissioner and his daughter Barbara, only to shoot her in the spine and paralyze her. He then kidnaps Gordon, putting him through torture, stripping him naked, putting a collar on him, and forcing him to crawl through a bunch of just horrifying people who laugh at him the whole way. And when Gordon asks what he's doing here, the Joker responds, You're doing what any sane man in your appalling circumstances would do. You're going mad. The Joker then forces Gordon to go through a carnival ride designed to make him nuts, making him question his convictions, pushing him to the edge, and then forcing him to look at dozens of pictures of his daughter who had just been shot in the spine, being brutalized, stripped, bleeding, and implying that he had forced himself on her. All of this just to show that Gordon was no different from the Joker, and that no one else was either. The Joker then pressures Batman, saying that he clearly had a bad day as well. After all, why would he dress like a giant bat and do what he does otherwise? And that's the point. He wants Batman to admit that he too is insane. 
He says that his memory is like a plague and that it's easier to not know. Sometimes he'll remember things one way and other times it's another, but it's better if his past is multiple choice so he doesn't have to face it. It's easier to be insane for him, but at least he can admit it. Now, there are plenty of differences between the Joker and the Batman, but the killing joke sees the Joker weaponizing insanity and trauma to show that while they are polar opposites, they are also two people who have very similar stories and that anyone can have that story. The only difference is how people react to experiencing this trauma. Both the Joker and Batman were changed forever, both are crazy in their own ways, but Batman chose to use this as an avenue towards helping others while Joker was consumed by it. And in this way, the writers are working to make mental trauma something that is relatable, rather than making the character experiencing it relatable. When it came to Endeavor at the beginning of this video, we could understand the ideas of being envious, angry, self-hating, all that good stuff. And because we can relate to these very normal feelings, they help lead us to empathizing with his trauma so that we can understand what he did and why. We aren't going to excuse it, but we can at least understand it. These are relatable emotions that just about anyone can feel, and that's where we're building his character from. But insanity is by default something that most people can't empathize or really understand. So the killing joke makes the experience and not the emotion of going insane something relatable. It doesn't need you to understand what insanity is like. It just wants you to understand that terrible things can happen to people and some of them are going to be okay afterwards and some of them just aren't. And that doesn't inherently make them a bad person. It just makes them a person who went through something bad and couldn't take it. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this video is another version of the Joker, and more specifically, the Jared Leto version. Nah, but can you imagine? No, we're going to be talking about the Joaquin Phoenix one from the Joker movie in 2019. You got nothing left to lose? Everybody just yells and screams at each other. Nobody's civil anymore! Nobody thinks what it's like to be the other guy. If it was me dying on the sidewalk, you'd walk right over me. Alright, firstly, I am not going to be talking about the whole sympathetic aspect of this character. What I am going to be talking about is actually something that only specific characters give us access to, and it's generally pretty rare that we get this for villains. So specifically, we're going to talk about the role of an unreliable narrator. This is one of the most interesting styles of writing a story for me, but it can also be one of the easiest to fuck up. Some other examples of this kind of storytelling include The Life of Pi, Shutter Island, Moon Knight, Forrest Gump, Fight Club, and Catcher in the Rye. The list goes on, but the general idea for this trope is that there is some kind of inherent flaw in the narrator's perspective on the story. The generally accepted categories for this are the picaro, someone who is exaggerating and bragging the whole time, the clown, someone who makes a joke of the story that they're telling, the naive, someone who is immature or has a limited point of view, the liar, someone trying to deliberately misrepresent the story, and the one that we're going to look at here, the madman, someone whose perspective is altered through the lens of some kind of mental health disorder, dissociation, or mental defense mechanism. Regardless of the category being used, we are forced to re-examine the story being told to us and second-guess everything that we've seen or heard so far, and wonder which parts were accurate and which were embellished or flat out incorrect or imagined. In cases like we see in Forrest Gump or Life of Pi, these are often seen to be more positive or fun variants of this storytelling method, or they're meant to help with coping with the stress of a situation that they have lived through. But specifically with the Madman perspective, we get stories I really enjoy. There is no experience in storytelling like reaching the end of a book or a movie and then realizing that the character who was our lens into that world had imagined everything or been delusional. If it's done incorrectly, we end up with that feeling of the cliché, it was all a dream, and that can sometimes feel very hollow as a result. However, when done well, this can be an absolutely chilling experience. It's a single moment that can give you the feeling of insanity, of not knowing what's real or what's fake, and not knowing what to believe. Obviously, this only exists if you're fully immersed in the story, but it's a tool which can be used to help the audience empathize with characters in a way that would be impossible otherwise. 
It is one thing to talk about the Joker when Batman is our lens. It is an entirely different thing to see life through his eyes. Throughout the story of the Joker, we are meant to sympathize with this dude who is struggling through his daily life as a result of his mental health issues. From making him a target of bullies to the abuse that he gets everywhere he goes, we can really feel for him, but for many people it's impossible to feel like him. But then we reach the end of the movie and we get a look back at how his brain had altered so many different experiences and distorted the plot that we had been presented with the entire time. Our whole experience with his world had been separate from reality. And as he realizes what has happened, so do we. And just for a few seconds we get this feeling of both complete clarity and total confusion. Where you don't quite understand what's true, but things start to click into place slowly and the entire message of the movie changes. This is a writing tool that is so rarely available when it comes to villains because we almost never get to see the world through their point of view. Off the top of my head, we have things like Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, Megamind, and Despicable Me. Yeah, I'm sure there's a couple more, but it's a pretty limited list, and of those, we're usually seeing a more sympathetic perspective and almost never getting that unreliable madman narrator. It is such an underutilized and not readily available tool that it feels fresh and interesting almost every time, and it's one thing that I knew I wanted to talk about when I thought of this video. But that is actually it for this video. Let me know your thoughts on crazy characters being portrayed as villains. Are you for it? Are you against it? Are there some you like or don't like specifically? As well as giving me suggestions for the God Complex video, which I'll be working on as soon as this one goes up. A big thank you again to Shonen OG for helping me out in this video. Remember to go check out his channel so we can help him get to 10k. And of course, a massive thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video and helping to make it possible. You can check them out in the link in the description or in the pinned comment down below. But with all of that being said, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, I hope you all stay excellent.